next, we will be presenting several rays of hope, beginning in Afghanistan. Please welcome the CEO and co-founder of Conservation X Labs, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex. And in 2006, I was invited to serve as the first country director for the Wildlife Conservation Society's Afghanistan program, which was tasked with building that nation's first national park. This is the story of that startup. The view that most people have of Afghanistan is informed by the images that they see in the media. It is a place of hopelessness and devastation. Images are shown of a place of devoid of life. Afghanistan's the longest running war in US history. There are children born at the start of the war that can now enlist to serve in it. And when I first got to Afghanistan, my impressions would initially affect the images that I saw in the media. Afghanistan was still picking up the pieces from three decades of conflict. Landing at the airport, I saw deminers working adjacent to runways and wrecked planes. In the cities, some buildings were just only destroyed shells or pockmarked with holes from bullets and rocket fire. But we were hoping to find optimism among the rubble. WCS's mandate was to survey what happened to Afghanistan's biodiversity after three decades of war, to help set up the governance institutions and laws needed to protect its wildlife, and to lay the groundwork to create a national park system. We'd focus on three areas, the Wakhan Corridor at the western end of the Himalaya, the rich montane forests of Nuristan, and funny, finally the stunning Hazard Jet Plateau, a location proposed for the country's first national park, Banda Amir. Afghanistan is a country rich in habitat and topography. It contains part of the Himalayas, dense montane forests, plateaus and landscapes that would make you think you were in the American Southwest, pistachio woodlands reminiscent of Afri African savannas, expansive wetlands critical to global bird migrations, and scorching red sand deserts all contained within a single country. And much as Afghanistan was a tributary of the Silk Road, the great trade route, it was also a biological Silk Road. It straddled three of the world's eight great biogeographic realms, the Paleo-Arctic, which includes Eurasia, the Afrotropic, which includes Africa, and the Indo-Malaya, which includes Southeast Asia. Its location on the crossroads of empires and ecosystems brings together fauna as diverse as brown bears and Asiatic black bears, hyenas and jackals, macaques and flying squirrels, flamingos and golden eagles, snow leopards and cheetahs, and even lions and tigers. And when I accepted a the position of WCS, we were already six months behind schedule. I arrived in Afghanistan with $10,000 in cash, no staff, vehicles, equipment, security systems, office space, housing, or even permission to work in the country. And I had four weeks to set that up and get teams into the field. We needed to get into some of the most remote environments on earth, and we would start travel by road. As we approached the walk-on corridor, the roads would get harder to discern from the environment around them which made driving somewhat tricky, as you can imagine. And then the roads would disappear altogether. We would then have to switch to pack animals, yaks, horses, donkeys, travel by foot. WCS scientists would end up traveling for weeks in remote environments. And the remoteness and elevation of some of our field sites, coupled with the lack of emergency infrastructure or healthcare, posed significant risks to our teams. Beyond the remoteness of our field sites, we faced challenges that we're still in an insurgency with risks of improvised explosive devices, kidnapping, and being caught in collateral fire. But to us, the landmines were the most dangerous threats to our security. Afghanistan at the time was the third most heavily landmined country in the world. And because military forces indiscriminately planted them across shifting battlegrounds, danger hung over us every time we went out into the field. One of the most spectacular places we would work is the walk-on corridor, which the Afghans refer to as the roof of the world. This long strip of land was the buffer zone between the British and the Russian empires during the great game of the 19th centuries. The mountains of Wuhan are so high that the north-south bird migration is diverted west to east along this corridor. It sits at the collision of great mountain ranges, the Pamirs, Karakams, Hindu Kush, Tian Shan, and Kunluns, that create a giant jumble of topography referred to as the Pamir Knot. And this is what it looks like. It is a landscape of high U-shaped valleys, cascading glaciers, and beautiful montane uh, meadows. And it was also really remote, requiring us to travel for weeks to access conservation regions to determine what had happened to its wildlife. In Wakhan, we would survey many species, but in particular wanted to understand what had happened to two of them. First, we wanted to assess the status of Marco Polo sheep, 
which I like to call Princess Leia sheep, whose horns can be about two me up to two meters long. They are the biggest of the mountain sheep, the Argali, named for Marco Polo, who described these great sheep in his 13th century travel log when he traveled through the Wakhan. Our task was to figure out what happened to them. We also wanted to know what happened to Wakhan's most spectacular resident, the snow leopard. We estimated there was about 100 snow leopards in Afghanistan from initial modeling, but weren't sure. We believe their numbers have fallen due to declining prey base caused by overgrazing of the rangelands, retaliatory killing of snow leopards because of fear of predation on domestic livestock and wildlife trade for their furs. So we started surveying for them and for their prey, using camera traps and looking for evidence of sign. Simultaneously, we worked with local communities to improve the management of the rangelands, help those communities protect their domestic animals from predation, and developed ecotourism programs that tied the proposed protected area, that were tied to the proposed protected areas. And what we found was far more snow leopards than we even expected, and strong populations of Marco Polo sheep that justified this protecting these conservation areas. The second place we worked was in a province of Nuristan, whose name translates into the land of light. Nuristan, Nuristan straddled Afghanistan's northeastern border of Pakistan. It is a heavily forested region, part of the eastern forest complex, a forest of oak and cedar. And the topography is steep and have served to protect and isolate its wildlife and its people. The Nuristanis are legendarily fierce fighters. They live on the steep mountainsides and would raid travelers passing below. They were beloved by Alexander the Great because of their wild dancing wine and song, who believed that they were lost followers of Dionysus. Nuristan, however, and Kunar next to it, was one of the most dangerous areas in Afghanistan, given its location among the federally administered tribal regions in Pakistan. It would be here, in the Valley of Death, that the United States would ultimately pull out. And it would be here, high in the Nuristani villages, that WCS would set up an office. The Eastern Forest Complex, in which Nuristan is part of, is under tremendous deforestation pressure. And here, as in Wuhan, were spectacular species, including the Persian leopard, which lived at lower elevations than the snow leopard, the exceptionally beautiful Palaces cat, which could be found in alpine and subalpine valleys of the region, and the Marhor, a twin-horned unicorn whose name translates to snake eater. The habitat is rich in biodiversity, including things like polecats, Asiatic black bear, a myriad of different types of cats, wolves, hyenas, and even primates like macaques. We ran an extensive scientific program involving surveys, camera trapping, and genetic analysis, as well as remote sensing to determine what had happened to the wildlife in the woodlands. It wasn't easy, as our sites would be bombed by NATO forces fighting insurgents, or our teams accused of spying for the Americans. And given the remoteless topography and security situation, working there required us to hire and train teams uh, from the region as conservation scientists. And despite the challenges, they succeeded. We found important populations of Asiatic black bear and other species that survived despite three decades of war. But one species that hadn't been seen in over 50 years was something called the musk deer, desired for the fragrant waxy droppings from the musk gland on its belly that used to be traded for perfume. Before, because it existed in the most steep hillsides, few knew that it even existed. There was scant evidence. I like to call the musk deer Bambi with fangs. Uh, WCS teams would go on to actually confirm its existence through identification of hairs collected from the site and spottings. Once we got to Afghanistan, we had to confront another challenge, the issue of wildlife trade. We began to hear stories about bulk orders, orders from Westerners for tens of comforters made out of snow leopard and leeks and lynx involving multiple animals per bedspread. We found wildlife trade was an issue with Afghans too, such as the stuffed Persian leopard. And we found stores in a part of Kabul known as Chicken Street were selling pelts of Afghanistan's endangered wildlife. Wildlife was also sold in markets at US and NATO military bases and at embassies. What was most surprising was that the biggest driver of wildlife trade was the humanitarian community the very people who came to Afghanistan to help it. So we started a massive effort to shut down this threat, both working on enforcement and raising awareness. We worked with the US military police to shut down wildlife markets on US and NATO bases, and with foreign governments to shut down illegal trade at embassies. We worked with the Afghan government, to create and enforce endangered species laws and protect international trade that was illegal under foreign laws. And we raised awareness with the international community in Afghanistan. This included working with Afghan customs to seize pelts of endangered species, and for a long time, the only posters in that airport were ours. 
we were really successful in shutting down the markets and the demand for furs. Then I got a call from the fur sellers who wanted to see me. I agreed to do so. And I imagined them coming with 1920 Tommy guns coming to cut me down at my desk. We had no guns, but I took the meeting and they surprised me. The fur dealers asked us to train them as to what species to protect so they wouldn't undercut Afghanistan's wildlife. We ran training sessions for the sellers at Chicken Street and those that sold on the military basis. Ultimately, WCS started training US soldiers before they even went to Afghanistan to change demand. Finally, we worked in the Hazard Chat Plateau to help create Bandamir National Park, which the government was close to creating until in 1979 until it was interrupted by the Soviet invasion. Bandamir and other important conservation sites are located in the Hazard Chat Plateau in the center of Afghanistan, that place that looks like the American Southwest. It's best known for the town of Bamiyan, which used to contain the two great Colossi, the giant Buddha statues that stood watch over empires before they were unceremoniously blown up by the Taliban. But 60 miles away was an amazing work of nature. Six travertine lakes bound by glistening white porcelain dams created by the accretion of supersaturated calcium carbonate, a similar process to the formation of stalactites and slagmites. The high peaks of the lakes are filled with fossils. The region was a conservation hotspot, again under threat. As in other places, we would survey for wildlife and start working with local communities on conservation. And we will be able to verify the presence of snow, Persian leopards, and ibex. Because of the symbolic significance, we worked to make Bandamir Afghanistan's first national park. We worked to connect Afghan institutions at all levels, from the national level to the provincial government to local, local villages, which were elected uh, from each of the villages in the park's watershed to ensure that they would have the voice in the management of the park. And watching the conservation committee set up the rules for the management of the park was like watching the American Constitutional Convention. We realized through the work, we weren't just protecting wildlife and wild lands, we were building democracy. And people asked, why did Afghans care about wildlife and didn't Afghanistan have more important problems? But given the dependency of 80% of the population on the natural environment, the very factors that were supporting the species we sought to protect would support them and their survival. We started noticing also that Afghan culture celebrated its wildlife. We found images of wildlife decorating people's houses, as well as on 2,000-year-old petroglyphs and along the paths in the Wakhan. We believe for the people of Afghanistan, of which millions were forced to be refugees, this project was a way of restoring and reaffirming their identity. In 2008, Afghanistan would create its first national park at Banda Amir. This year, Afghanistan created its fifth. Banda Amir gets 170,000 visitors a year, almost all Afghan. This is their park, and they want it. Conservation ultimately is about hope. It is fueled by optimism. You can, if you can create a success in Afghanistan, we can create a success anywhere. If you want to hear more about setting up the first national park in Afghanistan, check out the Snow Leopard Project, which documents the story of this effort, and the Wildlife Conservation Society, which works there to this day. Thank you for letting me share the story with you, and dare mighty things.